This address by Randall Wright was given at BYU's Campus Education Week on August 17, 2009. Hello, my name is Randall Wright, and uh, we'll be speaking today about achieving our life missions. And uh, as we think about that topic, why am I here on the earth? I've been in many classes, as perhaps you, uh, through the years when that question's been asked. Why are we on earth? And almost without fail, we hear two answers. We're here to gain a body, and we're here to be tested. And that's a great answer. Obviously, it's true for everyone here, as it is for all 6.7 billion people on Earth right now. That does not answer the question why I'm here specifically, what role I have in the great plan of salvation, why am I here on the Earth? And so today, we'll talk about that subject. In 1990, I was asked to be the session director of the first especially for youth ever held in the East. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, it was the first time that the session director had been asked to speak on the Thursday night. Always before, there was a musical fireside, then we would go into the testimony meetings. But that year, we started a tradition of the session director speaking at that fireside. Well, everything was good. I had my talk. Everything was ready. At noon on the Thursday, though, of the fireside, I had a little problem. I've been talking to those youth from throughout the East, from Rhode Island. How many people are in your high school that are LDS? I'm the only LDS in my high school. How many times have you had LDSs and LDS members in your classroom? I've never had an LDS member since I started kindergarten in my class. As I talked to those youth, I just thought, this talk is not what they need to hear. However, I didn't know what they needed to hear. In fact, I didn't know why I was there. Had no idea why I was there. And uh, <clears throat> the longer it went, the more I asked that question, why am I here? Several people had asked, how did you get to do the first EFY in the East? I said, I have no idea. Uh, obviously, they were hurting for people that year, and so they chose me to go. Uh, that day, at noon, I looked at my talk. I read my talk. I thought about all the people I had talked to during the week, all those young people and all the struggles they had uh, being isolated from the church and other members. And I took the talk and tore it up into pieces and threw it in the garbage can and thought, now what? You have an hour talk tonight, and you have no material whatsoever. One of the counselors was walking by, and uh, I asked that counselor if he would do something for me. He said he'd be glad to. What is that? I said, would you give me a blessing? We went into a little dorm room <clears throat> at the College of William and Mary, and he laid his hands on my head, and I'll never forget some of the things that he said. I won't share all those with you except this. He said there are many people that would like to be here this week at this, especially for youth in, youth in your place. And I thought, yeah, several of them called me. Uh, <clears throat> then he said, there are many people qualified to be here this week. And I thought, yes, every one of them, more so than me, I'm sure. And then he said, but the Lord wants you here this week. And then he closed out the blessing and left. I can't tell you what happened. I just laid on the bed and not ashamed to say I cried hard. The Lord wants me here this week? Are you kidding? That has great implications, doesn't it, for all of us? Maybe the Lord wants you with those children that you have, wants you to be the bishop, wants you to be the Relief Society president or the visiting teacher to that person. That's a tremendous responsibility to realize that the Lord has sent us here for a specific reason with a specific plan to accomplish and that we're here for a reason, saved for this time. That had a tremendous influence on me. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to just read a statement by President Spencer W. Kimball that I think is very, very important. He says this, before we came here, faithful women were given certain assignments while faithful men were foreordained 
to certain priesthood tasks. So men and women, male, female, priesthood holders, sisters to a specific mission on earth. President Kimball goes on. While we do not now remember the particulars, this does not alter the glorious reality of what we once agreed to. You are accountable for those things which long ago were expected of you. Listen to what he says next. Just as are those we sustain as prophets and apostles. We have a responsibility. We are to accomplish those things that we've been sent to do just as the prophets and apostles have been expected to carry out certain responsibilities. That's called foreordination. We are foreordained, chosen before the world began to carry out a certain responsibility. It's a huge responsibility that we all share. I would assume in the preexistence that we were witnesses to many great things. Obviously, when the plan of salvation was presented, Jesus Christ chosen as the Savior of the world, we obviously witnessed that. We obviously sustained that. The question is, did we watch other assignments being given? Did we watch as Adam was chosen to be the first man, Eve chosen to be the mother of all mortal beings? I think surely we would have seen that. Did we see Noah chosen to be a great prophet? Did we see Abraham, father of the faithful, chosen to come down and to carry out that responsibility? Surely we saw others, Peter, James, and John chosen, Mary to be the mother of Christ on earth. Surely we saw Joseph Smith called to a special mission. Did we also see a President Gordon B. Hinckley, a President Thomas Monson chosen? We don't know all the answers to that. We do know that we saw Christ chosen and that we supported that. Now for the rest, did we get those assignments? I think sometimes we think, uh, yeah, we saw all that. Then what happened? Well, we were all gathered up, all the rest of us and came to get our responsibilities. Okay, here's what you're to do. You're to go down to earth and watch television for four hours a day. You're to text as much as you can till your thumbs hurt. You're to play video games. You're to hang out with your friends. You're to shop till you drop. Everyone gather around, let's group hug and go. Uh, <laughs> is that it? Is that why we shouted for joy? You go, I don't think so. Surely we had a part to play in the overall plan. And it's not just a clap and cheer for those who had the lead roles. So Job 38, seven, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy we were there. Why were we shouting for joy? Surely because we all had a part to play. President Benson said this, for nearly 6,000 years, God has held you in reserve to make your appearance before the final days of the, before the second coming of the Lord. It is that God has saved for the final inning some of his strongest children who will help bear off the kingdom triumphantly. And so for us, we have a responsibility to help bear off that kingdom triumphantly. We know that's part of our mission. We know that we were saved for this time for a specific purpose, to help bear off the kingdom of God. Now the question is, what role do we play? President Henry Eyring said this, you will need bravery because we have a mission that's in the last days, right before the Lord's second coming. There is a battle going on, just as the preexistence. You will need bravery, and you will need boldness, because you are enlisted in the Lord's army in the last dispensation. He goes on to say, this is not a time of peace. We know that. We have seen it intensify, this great war. And the scriptures suggest that the war will become more violent and the spiritual casualties on the Lord's side will mount 
we're seeing that. There's hardly a family that hasn't been affected by this. The spiritual casualties are tremendous in our day. Satan's goal is obvious. It is to destroy us, to destroy our missions, and destroy something even more important than individuals, it appears. And that is what Pre Bishop Victor L. Brown said is Satan's ultimate goal. His ultimate goal, according to Bishop Brown, is this. Satan's ultimate goal is to destroy the family. Because if he would destroy the family, he will not just have won the battle, he will have won the war. So Satan starts by destroying individuals. He makes his side look so appealing, so enticing that people say, I want to join that side. He also says something else as he whispers in our ears, you don't have any talents. You don't have any gifts. You have nothing to offer the Lord's side. Just sit on the sideline, clap and cheer for the present Monsons, clap and cheer for the brethren, and sit on the sidelines because you have nothing to offer. You have no gifts. You have no talents. And in the process, with all the talents sitting on the sidelines watching, Satan has a heyday, destroying the souls of men, therefore destroying families, and thwarting the work of the Lord and his great army. The angel who appeared to Nephi said something very interesting. I think a lot of us over the years have wondered about this. How can it be so black and white? From 1 Nephi 14.10. And he said unto me, this angel speaking to Nephi, Behold, there are saved two churches only. As we think about the churches and we think about battles, we think about armies, I believe the angel is referring to two armies. The churches mean armies here. <clears throat> the angel who appeared to Nephi referred to the army in the battle as churches. And then he says, behold, there are two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God. The other is the church of the devil. And you go, wow, it's so black and white. How can it be just one church here, one there, polar opposites of each other? How can that be? Surely we can be a little bit on one side. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God, belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and is the whore of all the earth. And so we have a battle going on. There's two churches. There's two armies. Which side are we on? We say, obviously, we're on the Lord's side. And yet, some of us want to be a little bit on the other side, too. I never really understood the scripture until one day, standing on a battlefield in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the site of a three-day battle with 46,000 people killed or wounded. As I stood there and looked, I thought, I get it. I get the two churches. You're either north or south here on this battlefront. You can't be a little bit south and a little bit north. What is that called? You're a traitor to the cause if you go over. You're either north or south here. And I thought, that's the Lord. You're either on his side or you're not on his side. <clears throat> so for all of us, we have a certain responsibility that we are to carry out in this great battle of the last days. Ours is on the Lord's side, the Lord's army, the Lord's church. We have a responsibility. Several years ago, the 37 in September, I had a chance to spend some time in a waiting room here in Provo, Utah. And as we sat there, my wife in labor for 35 hours, I didn't really know what it meant fully when the doctor said, 
she needs an emergency C-section. I wasn't even really sure what that meant. And uh, here, with no family here, I had an opportunity to sit in that room for several hours, not knowing what was going to happen. It was a very frightening time for me. As you can imagine, I didn't forget to say my prayers that night. I was very specific with those prayers. And as I prayed, I made some commitments as we sometimes do. And I told the Lord that if he would spare my wife and my child, that I would study families. I would do everything I could to try to see what made families successful, what hurt families, what destroyed families. And I just made that vow that night. My emphasis specifically was on those lures and temptations of Satan. And so the research became kind of slanted toward uh, some of those lures, especially electronic media, television, movies, music, internet, anything to do with electronic media. The more I studied, the more I saw that, you know what, every time we discover something, Satan comes out with two or three more things. And you just say, I can barely keep up with all of his lures, all the temptations. He go from one to another. He solve one, and he comes out with something else. And I thought, the only way we're going to make it is to realize who we are. So that those things are no longer appealing. Once we realize who we are and the mission we are to play in the overall plan, all of a sudden the lures and temptations of Satan do not look all that tempting because we have a work to do. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said this. He spoke of coordination and the specific missions and told us something very specific. He said that coordination is like any other blessings. It is con a conditional bestowal subject to our faithfulness. Prophecies, he says, foreshadow events without determining the outcomes. Because of a divine foreseeing of that outcome, so coordination is a conditional bestowal of a role, responsibility, or a blessing that likewise foresees but does not fix the outcome. So just because we have a foreordained mission does not mean we will achieve that. We have to realize what it is and then actually achieve that. So because Johnny Page, for example, was called to go to the Holy Land with Orson Hyde to dedicate the Holy Land for the return of the Jews, he didn't fulfill that assignment. Arson Hyde ended up going by himself without his missionary companion. He had the call. He did not fulfill the call. Oliver Cowdery, a great man, very talented, had a role to fill. Joseph Fielding Smith said that Oliver Cowdery lost his right to go to Carthage, and Hiram took it. He had the call, foreordained to do it, but it was conditional on faithfulness, the same with us. So in the Lord's army, there's many positions that need to be filled. Jesus Christ is obviously our commander in chief. At this time, President Thomas S. Monson is the general of the Lord's army on earth. In an army, there's so many positions that need to be filled. Uh, the Lord does not need a general right now. Among us, he's got his general, as President Monson. What he needs is other positions filled. And that's where we come in. We take our marching orders from our general. We look to him. But can I say that President Monson, <clears throat> at general conference, without someone to run the microphones, cannot be heard? So in a sense, what good would it be for President Monson to stand in the front of the conference center and no one hear him? All of a sudden, the microphone people are critical to what happens. What about the television people that broadcast his talks to the world? And you go, oh, thank you for fulfilling that assignment to show these great messages to the world. Who's more important at that time? We don't talk about who's more important. Everyone's equally important. What about the custodian that has the keys to the conference center? What if he doesn't show up on conference day? 
Everyone's outside. Who's most important now? Everyone is most important. Everyone working totally together in the Lord's army to make it all work as the gospel marches forth to the world. Now there's places we can look. We asked, where can we find out what our life mission is? There's obviously places we can look. The place we need to look first at, I believe, is our patriarchal blessings. Extremely critical. Why? Because the first presidency is going to talk about what those first those patriarchal blessings really include. And let's just think about what they're saying here. Patriarchal blessings contemplate an inspired declaration of the lineage of the recipient. And when so moved upon by the Spirit, listen closely, an inspired and prophetic statement of the life mission of the recipient. Together with such blessings, Cautions, admonitions, as the patriarch, patriarch may be prompted to give for the accomplishment of such life's mission. So what are patriarchal blessings? <clears throat> they are the prophetic statement of our life missions. Have we realized what we have in our hands with those patriarchal blessings? I hope we have. Fortunately, we are able to look at a few patriarchal blessings, especially of prophets, apostles, as they live their life, and possibly when they pass away, occasionally we'll see books where we get to read a little of their patriarchal blessings. I'd like to read a couple of excerpts from patriarchal blessings from very uh, important people in the Lord's army. One, Bryant S. Hinckley. This was given in 1895. This is the father of President Gordon B. Hinckley. To Bryant S. Hinckley, the patriarch said, you shall not only become great yourself, which he was, but your posterity will become great. From your loins shall come forth statesmen, prophets, priests, and kings to the Most High God. The priesthood will never depart from your family, no, never. To your posterity there shall be no end. And the name of Hinckley shall be honored in every nation under heaven. Did the prophet know? To his mother, Ada Bittner Hinckley, the eye of the Lord has been upon thee from thy birth. And a decree of the Father has gone forth that thou shalt have a mission to fill, a work to do. Thy name shall be perpetuated and live in the memory of the saints. Sister Hinkley, you have a mission to fill. You are to raise the greatest temple builder in history. Men and women, as President Kimball said, have those divine foreordained calls. To President Gordon B. Hinckley, thou shalt grow to the full statue of manhood and shall become a mighty <clears throat> and valiant leader in the midst of Israel. Thou shalt ever be a messenger of peace. The nations of the earth shall hear thy voice and be brought to a knowledge of the truth by the wonderful testimony which thou shalt bear. President Gordon B. Hinckley. It's not, however, just prophets that can look to their patriarchal blessings. We had a girl come into the Austin Institute several years ago, and uh, I was fairly sure she was not a member of the church, although she was with one of our members. Uh, she was smiling, a huge smile. As I looked down at her, I found out that she had gone to a church meeting in a southern Texas town. Uh, right before that, uh, she was with a member who didn't take anything. He took her down to a reunion to wear. He had a blue jeans, flip flops, a t-shirt, and uh, he decided he needed to go to church. And uh, Monica, who had asked him to go with her at her father's request so she didn't have to go by herself and drive, uh, felt like she should go with him. So she put on a tank top and a mini skirt that her aunt had and flip flops and went to church to a small branch. And Monica said, I've never been treated any better 
Relief Society president there treated her like a queen. They said nothing about how they were dressed. Uh, Monica that day wrote in her journal that perhaps she had missed something in life, that she had failed to look at religion. And she needed to look closer at that. She ended up in an institute class. I watched as she investigated the church. I watched as she finally joined the church and became a faithful, active member in the church. Uh, Monica was getting her patriarchal blessing. She asked how she should prepare for that. We talked about some of those things, how she should probably fast, read the Book of Mormon totally through, uh, pray fervently, and uh, she did all those things. She asked my wife and I to go with her to get her patriarchal blessing. On the way over, she asked several questions. She asked if he would talk about her husband and her children. What do I say? I don't know what the patriarch's going to say. Will he tell me what tribe I'm from? Will he tell me about my gifts and talents? Will he tell me that one day me and my husband will stand before the judgment bar and the Lord would say he's pleased? And I thought, I don't know. I've never heard that before in my life. I'm trying to avoid all these questions. We go over to the patriarchs, uh, and she receives her patriarchal blessing. But Monica has allowed me to uh, read a portion of her journal on the day that she got her patriarchal blessing. She says this, I hope tonight that I will learn how to use my God-given talents and gifts to serve the Lord. She's asking again what her mission is. I have fasted and prayed to know his will for me, and I know it will be revealed to me by his servant. You see the faith coming out now. I know that that patriarch is going to tell me my mission in life. I pray I will always be able to live worthy of the blessings and have the Spirit with me. I dream of the day when I shall stand before God with my husband, and he will embrace me and be able to say, I'm proud of you. Again, I've never heard of that before, standing uh, with your husband or wife at the judgment bar, but that was her questions. Uh, we were there as she received that blessing. He got to the end. He hadn't mentioned anything about her husband or her children. There was a huge pause. Uh, I didn't know why he was waiting so long. And then he told about her husband and children. I'm looking as uh, Monica is crying. And uh, she let me share this with you from her journal, April the 5th, 2000 night. It was amazing. I was speechless, breathless. I don't even know what to think. I know with an absolute assurity that Patriarch Williams was acting as the voice of the Lord. All the answers to all my questions were in that blessing. I can't wait to get it so I can read it over and over again. He said that my husband and I would be able to stand together at the judgment bar and Heavenly Father would be pleased. I'm sitting there thinking, are you kidding? <laughs> That's the very question she's asking coming over here, and now that patriarch said those very words. At the end, he talked about my children. He talked about my talents and said I could use them to lift people and that I have a lot of work to do with genealogy. I am from the tribe of Judah. We knew that. Her dad was Jewish, her mother was Jewish, her grandparents were Jewish all the way back. And that patriarch knew it also. And he said, I would be a great example to all those around me. More importantly, I learned that my Heavenly Father loves me so very much. Well, patriarchs are inspired. I can still see in my mind uh, Monica smiling in my class, just as I can see her smiling right now because she's with us today. A young girl who found out what her mission in life was. I also remember her doing family history with my wife. We took a little trip to Victoria, Texas. They didn't find a lot. Uh, I didn't know anything about what they were doing, but I did want to stop by this historical building to look in the window because it was closed. Looked in the window as we got in the car to leave. Uh, someone drove into the parking lot and the man said, can I help you? said, we're just doing research for Monica. And uh, he said, well, come into the building. Walks in. I remember him asking, who are you looking for? And Monica said, Abraham Levi, my second great-grandfather. Uh, there was silence. And then he said, I'm working on a book on Abraham Levi. 
Um, let's just say there was a lot of family history work done in Monica's family. As you look at her words and think of her words, all of those things, all of those inspired things the prophet talked about, excuse me, the patriarch talked about, fulfilling prophetic words, that we do have a mission on earth. I was able to go to a wedding in Salt Lake City of Monica, still smiling there in her wedding and smiling here with us today. Again, a young Jewish girl who found out who she was. For us, we need to think about our patriarchal blessings, and obviously we need to really look closely at them. I hope we'll look close. It will go back to our patriarchal blessings. We'll analyze them, and we'll look close. What are the gifts and talents that are mentioned in your patriarchal blessing? Why not take those out and just write down, here are my gifts, here are my talents. Also, what opportunities did the patriarch say you will have in this life? Take those out, write those down. These are my opportunities. What blessings will you receive in life? What counsel, what teachings does that patriarchal blessing give you? Write those things down where you know exactly what counsel you've been given. What warnings are given in that blessing? In the Doctrine and Covenants, you'll see often kind of patriarchal blessings in some of those cases where people come to Joseph Smith, ask what their mission is in life. He goes to the Lord. We get to read those. And often we'll see the words, beware of pride, for example. It seems like everyone that was given that counsel falls to pride. So what warnings are given in that blessing? And what insights do you gain about your life mission from that. Several of the brethren have said similar things, but let's move to a next uh, area, and that is ask Heavenly Father specific questions about our mission. Why not go to Heavenly Father and say, I've read my patriarchal blessing. Now, can you give me any more insights about what it is I'm supposed to accomplish on earth? Once you receive those revelations, and that's what it'll be, then obviously we should write them down. That's what the prophets did, isn't it? They went to the Lord, they asked specific questions, they got the answers, and then they wrote the answers. Do we write the answers to our prayers? Because this is the Lord's revelation to the whole church. He gives us personal revelation. Obviously, we're to follow the prophets, their example, and to write those things down. So I ask, do we write those down? Someone has said there never has been a revelation without a question first. Ooh, that's important. There never has been a revelation without a question first. Joseph Smith has a question. Heavenly Father, which church is true? And the Lord gives him the answers to that. It's called the first vision that occurred because of the question. Heavenly Father, is there just a heaven and a hell? I don't understand that. And so the Lord answers that with section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Specific answers to Joseph's questions. For us, are we asking those questions? Because scriptures result from asking questions, personal and to the entire church. The Apostle Paul had a vision. The Savior appears to Paul, and he has a question from Acts 9, 6. And he, trembling and astonished, astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me do? There's the question that Paul asked. What do you want me to do? What's my role in this? Well, Paul, why don't you become one of the greatest missionaries in history? Why don't you set the world up for Christianity? And what does Paul do? Exactly that. Easy task he's been given, very, very difficult task. But Paul asked the question, and he listened. And what we have now is the accounts of Paul and his great mission. So what we need is inspiration in our life. We need revelation. The Lord will give us that revelation if we ask. He's promised he will do that. So let's ask the Lord. Now, if we were to say, how do I get the Spirit in my life? I think we could all come up with several answers. I've heard that question asked before, and you'll hear read your scriptures, say your prayers, fast, listen to inspirational music, go to the temple, do service. But if you could just give one 
bit of advice to get the spirit, what would you give? I remember a story that's told from President Marin G. Romney. He was talking to Elder Joe J. Christensen as they left this campus going back to BYU. And President Romney told Elder Christensen about his call as a general authority. He was sitting in general conference. His name was read to be a new general authority. He was sustained as a new general authority. President Romney was a little shocked because no one had ever talked to him before that. Total surprise as he sat there, president of a Salt Lake stake. Now he's a general authority. He's a little uneasy about that. He goes to his friend, elder at the time, Harold B. Lee, member of the Quorum of the Twelve, and said, I want to do a good job. I need help. Will you give me some advice? And President Lee said, if you're going to be a successful general authority, obviously you'll need the spirit. I'll give you one piece of advice. In your mind, think about that one piece of advice. What would it be? And you say, why bring this up? Talking about life missions. It's so specific. Well, we need revelation. And <clears throat> he gives him something that I don't think I've ever heard in a Sunday school class before when the question was asked, how do I get the spirit? So I think this must be very important. President Harold B. Lee, if you were to be a successful general authority, <coughs> You will need to be inspired. You will need to receive revelation. I'll give you one piece of advice. Okay, what is it? Go to bed early and get up early. If you do, listen to the promise, your body and mind will become rested. Then in the quiet of those early morning hours, you will receive more flashes of inspiration and insight than at any time of the day. So there's a promise. If you will do this, you'll receive more inspiration than any other time. Well, we're familiar with some of this. We're familiar with Ben Franklin, at least. He said this, He that riseth late must trot all day, and scarce overtake his business at night, while laziness travels so slowly that poverty soon overtakes him. Drive thy business, let not that drive thee. And then those famous words, Early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's what the Lord needs in His army, isn't it? It costs money to run the army. We need bright people to do that, and we need healthy people to do that. Now the question is, does Brigham Young, excuse me, does Ben Franklin have it right? I think he has it right. I think research will back him up on all three. I also think those three things are probably the most desired things worldwide of all mortals. Health, Wisdom, wealth, that's probably the three most desired things. And he's saying, look, this one practice will get that. President Lee says this one practice will add to revelation. Uh, I think we need to also understand that the Lord had a program. We don't get to see his daily activity as a mortal on his mortal ministry much, but we can read occasionally, like Mark 1, 35. And in the morning, rising up a great deal before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. There's what Christ did on earth. And you see that pattern. Now we also have something from Doctrine and Covenants, and I'm going to fill in the blanks here of what weary and invigorate mean, because I think we read it over and over and we think, I know what that means. We're going to fill in the blanks here. Cease to be idle from Doctrine and Covenants 88, 124. Cease to be idle. Cease to be unclean. Cease to find fault with one another. Cease to sleep longer than is needful. Retire to thy bed early. Why? That you may not be physically or mentally exhausted, is what weary means. Arise early. Why would I do that? That your bodies and minds may be filled with life and energy. The definition of invigorated. And you go, wow, the promises there are incredible. I guess the question is, is Doctrine and Covenants 88, 124 a commandment? It is in the Doctrine and Covenants. Isn't it interesting that it comes right before section 89? Is this part of that health code? Elder Christensen goes on and says this, The world is a more beautiful place early in the morning. Life is much more calm. Now listen to what he says next. Much more can be accomplished in a shorter amount of time. 
not only much more accomplished, you can do it in a shorter amount of time if you follow this practice that presently shared. Some are habituated to going to bed late and sleeping much longer than your system really needs, and thus missing out on some of the, back to this, personal inspiration you could be receiving. So I challenge all of us to follow the prophets on this. It's one of the most broken of all. I challenge us to try it. See if the blessings come that are promised. Next, to determine our life mission, we need to identify our gifts and talents. Doctrine and Covenants says we all have them. Doctrine and Covenants 46, 11, <clears throat> For all have not every gift given unto them. For there are many gifts, and to every man is given a gift by the Spirit of God. None of us should say we don't have any gifts and talents. I think most of us think those gifts and talents, that means singing, dancing, acting, musicians, athletes, that's the ones with talents and gifts. And yet, I have never heard President Monson play classical violin, never heard him play the piano, I've never seen him in a dance competition, never saw him in any of the things that we normally attribute to talented people. What is it that President Monson has? What are his gifts? Tremendous storyteller, isn't he? Wow, you just go, every time, they just stick in your mind when he tells them. I don't know that I've ever seen anyone with that inspiration to act when the Spirit prompts him to do something. Tremendous love that he has. His gifts are a little different than we normally think about. And as you think about President Hinckley, did you ever see him in a dance competition or anything of the sort? Most of us have talents, very specific talents that will benefit the Lord's army. But some of us spend half our time worrying every day about what others have. Oh, I don't have any talents. And so I'll just clap and cheer for everyone else. That's a nice way out, right? Easy way out. Oh, I'll just clap and cheer for everyone else. I don't have any talents. We do have talents. Laman spent his whole life worried about Nephi, what he had, what he had lost. What did he lose? He was the birthright son. I don't know how much land Lehi had, maybe half acre out of town in the desert there, uh, some gold and silver. Laman spent his whole life, taught his kids to hate because he had been robbed of all his rights. What did he get instead of the half acre outside of town? All of North and South America. And he's worried about the little land there outside of Jerusalem. Just as the Lord would say to us, will you quit worrying about that? I have something great for you. A little boy, one of our neighbors, uh, was playing with a little green turtle here in Orem, Utah, a few years ago. And a neighbor boy was with him. The little boy is named Jared. That was uh, the neighbor. And Jared's father, Nolan, heard him talking with his little friend. And the friend say, you sure are lucky to have a turtle. One of those little green ones you buy down at the discount store. You sure are lucky to have a turtle. All I have is a dog and a cat and a horse. <laughs> I think sometimes we need to realize that we have a dog and a cat and a horse and quit worrying about the little turtles crawling around. Now, not only do we need to recognize our gifts, which we certainly do, we need to list those gifts and talents. I challenge you to do that, to make a list of all your gifts and talents. You'll be shocked at how many you actually have. Everything that you're strong at, everything that is something positive that you do in life. Make a list of those things because we have a little system in us that tries to keep us balanced and we can't get overbalanced. Why do we list all our strengths? Because we also have weaknesses that we need to overcome. And those defense mechanisms will not let you see all your weaknesses until you see all your strengths. 
You've got to be balanced here. List all your strengths because we also need to list our weaknesses. Now, we don't usually think of our prophets having weaknesses, but sometimes when you read their biographies, you say, well, maybe they had a couple. So let's go to President Hinckley. We'll go from his biography. You see if he's got a weakness that he needed to work on. When we went to the beach, Marjorie, we went to look and not play in the sand. Garden said, okay, you've seen the ocean. This is after five minutes there. You've seen the ocean, let's go. <laughs> Again, we're talking to President Hinckley. You see if he's got a little weakness here. Efficiency and punctuality were Hinckley trademarks. Thus his impatience with anything that infringed on his time, such as crowds and lines. On Memorial Day, they would go out to the graves of Grandma Bittner and Aunt May well before 7 a.m. to beat the crowds. The kids didn't realize later there were no crowds out there at that time of the morning or even later on Memorial Day. By Garden's definition, half a dozen cars in any given place at any time constituted a crowd. Each summer, the family did go to the drive-in movie at least once, but they literally never saw the end of a movie. <laughs> Before the feature was over, Garden would head for the exit rather than risk getting pinned in by a line, line of traffic. If a wedding reception started at 6 p.m., he and Marjorie arrived at 5.30. I'm sure they're still setting up there. There's President Hinckley and his wife there. Why? To beat the crowd. Uh, President Hinckley obviously was just a little bit impatient. The Lord says, if we have a weakness, we need to come to him. We've heard this scripture multiple times, Ether 12, 27. And if men will come unto me, I will show them their weakness. I give unto men weakness, that natural man tendency that we all have. The Lord gave us that so that we could overcome that. I'm sure President Hinckley went to the Lord many times about that impatience. I give to men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they'll humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then I will make weak things become strong unto them. President Hinckley, impatient. And President Hinckley took that to the Lord. In 1997, there were 51 temples in the church. But we had a president that was a little bit impatient. So he went to the Lord, please help me with this impatience. And three years later, in the year 2000, we had 102 temples in the church. The first 51 temples took 167 years the second took three years because the Lord took President Hinckley's impatience, a weakness, and turned it into perhaps one of his greatest strengths, just as he'll do with all of us. That is the promise. If you'll come to me, the Lord says, I'll show you your weaknesses, and then we'll make those weaknesses strong. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, God does not begin by asking about our ability but only about our availability. And if we then prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. What a great statement. The Lord's not worried about our abilities. You come to me, he says. We'll take care of that. We're just worried about your availability. Will you come forward? And if you'll prove dependable, then he's going to increase our capabilities, just as he did with President Hinckley. So our challenge is not only to list all our strengths, we should also, over the course of a week or two, list all of our weaknesses. Go, oh, I don't want to know them all. It's okay because you have your strengths to balance it out. And then you'll say, I need to work on this. I believe that our weaknesses are every bit as tied to our life mission as our strengths are that there's something about those that will help tremendously. Now, once we have listed our strengths, our weaknesses, we've gone to the Lord for help. Obviously, we need to set some goals to achieve 
what the Lord would have for us. President Ezra Taft Benson, every accountable child of God needs to set goals, short and long range goals. A man who is pressing forward to accomplish worthy goals can soon put despondency under his feet. And once a goal is accomplished, others can be set up. Years ago here at Brigham Young University, I had a class from a man. Most people didn't know who he was. I think most people know now, Stephen R. Covey. And uh, in that class, organizational behavior class, he asked us what we would be doing in 10 years. Growing up in Southeast Texas, country hick, I had no idea what I was going to be doing the next day. And all of this in 10 years, what are you going to be doing in five years? Talking about winning those private victories before winning the public one. And uh, I then, at his request to the class, I wrote down exactly what I was going to be doing in 10 years. That was 1974. In 1984, my mother came out to a business that I owned that we said we would have and uh, said, I don't know if you're interested in this, but this is your goals from 1974 in Steve Covey's class. Apparently, I'd left some things in a closet at her home. And uh, then she brought those out, and I was doing exactly what I said I would do. The problem was, uh, as exciting as that was, it was like, now what? I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. So I sat down, read my patriarchal blessing again, prayed, and asked the Lord to help, and uh, wrote out some things. And for most of them, I wrote out 100 life goals. I thought, this will probably never, ever happen. But I would love to work for the church education system. It won't happen, but I'm going to write it down anyway uh, in a small Texas town uh, in a business. I'd love to teach it education week. Why? I don't know, but I wrote it down, especially for youth. I wrote it down. Get a master's degree. I thought my English teacher would die if she knew I even wrote that down. Get a PhD in media influence. Teach it at least one class at BYU. And I just started writing down some things, thinking none of this will ever happen, but I'll write it down anyway. Will you go back and write down your life goals? What is it? But remember that I said what I would be doing in 10 years, what I said I would do. I think if we would translate it, it would say, me, 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 me. We're not talking about that. We're talking about going to the Lord. Now, once we've done that, it's going to take hard work. Uh, you may get a little discouraged. I know that. Uh, the sons of Mosiah got a little bit discouraged from Alma 26. 27. Now when our hearts were depressed and we were about to turn back, behold, the Lord comforted us and said, Go amongst thy brethren the Lamanites and bear with patience thine afflictions, and I will give you success. They didn't turn back. They achieved their life mission. And if they would have turned back, there would have been no 2,000 stripling warriors. There would have been no King Lamoni. There would have been none of those things. I love to see people accomplishing their mission. Last year in Virginia, uh, I met someone we haven't seen in many years. Her name is Jennifer Brinkerhoff. She's a full-time seminary teacher for the church down in the Gilbert, Arizona area. And we had a chance to take her back to the airport, found out at the start that she was the daughter of our former bishop that I was a executive secretary to, that her dad taught an institute class that my wife took when she was not a member of the church, when she was investigating the church. So we had this connection to Jennifer. Uh, as we drove, I asked why she wasn't working on a PhD, single, and uh, she said she didn't know. I pushed her for whatever reason. Found out later that two weeks before she was sitting in the BYU Center in Jerusalem and a little voice said, work on your PhD. Uh, we talked, she emailed, she's in a PhD program right now. Uh, I won't go into anything other than when she was 13 years old, she wrote in her journal after the Ethiopian fast that one day she's gonna help the families of Ethiopia. Her PhD program, won't go into it, other than she's been approved, I believe, to do research in Ethiopia on the families there. Coincidence, uh, this summer in July, Jennifer went to Ethiopia. Her mother was worried about her, called the church Jennifer. She was teaching it especially for youth at Utah State right before she went. 
Uh, she made some phone calls to the missionary couples there, asked if they had ever had a youth conference there, anything like that, no. Asked about the possibility. The missionary couple over there was very excited about that, told her she could. Uh, the Especially for Youth Program donated some T-shirts for that. Uh, Jennifer went to Ethiopia and held the first youth conference ever in Ethiopia. Jennifer and my wife and I in Virginia. Uh, Jennifer was the first, especially for youth, sponsored as far as t-shirts go. They didn't sponsor the program, it's just a youth conference, but they donated some of the things which uh, everyone's grateful for. And if you look at the eyes of the youth there in Ethiopia, uh, Africa, and see their little CTR rings that Jennifer brought to them. Great things are going to happen. They all, most of them have their t-shirts that, especially if you donated on backwards, but they don't know that, that's okay. Uh, but as you look at those eyes of someone in Ethiopia, to think that a seminary teacher in Gilbert, Arizona, could have an impact on a whole country. What is it that we've been called to do? I hope we'll go home. We'll think about what we've been asked to do. We'll go to our patriarchal blessings. We'll pray. We'll quit clapping on the sidelines and jump into the battle because we are at war. We have a tremendous work to do. I hope we'll do that and say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this BYU Campus Education Week presentation, visit our website at byub.org. This address by Randall Wright was given at BYU's Campus Education Week on August 17, 2009.